Hello, welcome to this course on polymers. Uh, in the couple of weeks, we have been discussing uh, polymer processing and recycling techniques and this is the last of the lectures uh, which will focus on uh, viscosity uh, exclusively for polymer processing as one of the applications in mind. And so, the focus will remain on viscosity as a property for characterization in uh, polymer processing. And uh, capillary rheometry is used, uh, the rotational rheometers have become quite common but from a polymer processing point of view, capillary rheometry is very important because of the high shear rates that can be achieved. And as we have seen in case of injection molding or several other polymer processing operation, high uh, shear rates are uh, always present, while in a rotational rheometer, such high shear rates may not be always possible. And uh, the viscosity that is measured using oscillatory uh, measurements is also quite commonly used. So, we will look at both of these in this lecture. So, capillary rheometry is nothing but uh, basically taking the fluid uh, in a capillary or a tube and uh, basically forcing it to flow through using a pump or any other arrangement. In this case, therefore, uh, the pressure at the entry is higher than the pressure at outlet and so fluid gets uh, pushed through a capillary and so this uh, delta P by L or uh, P1 minus P2 by L is the pressure drop. And uh, what we can do is we can measure the amount of uh, fluid through the flow rate. And so, if this were to be a Newtonian fluid, uh, then the relation between the flow rate and uh, delta P by L is well known through this uh, Huygen Poiseuille equation, which is uh, always studied in the first course on fluid mechanics. And so, if we uh, know a capillary size, uh, the radius or the diameter, and if we know the length of the tube and how much is the pressure drop that is there and the flow rate we measure, then we can in fact determine the viscosity of the fluid. So, th that is how capillary rheometry can be used to measure the viscosity of the fluid. And in case of Newtonian fluid, this is straightforward. But in case of an unknown fluid, the viscosity is not just known, even the relationship between flow rate and pressure drop is not given by Hagen Poiseuille equation. And we cannot solve and get this equation because we do not even know what is the relation between stress and strain rate for that particular material. We do not even know whether we can approximate it as a shear thinning material, should we approximate it as a uh, using a PTT model or should we use a Gisikas model. So, none of those are known. We, we do not even know what is this material like. So, in such cases, how do we do? And so, again uh, knowing uh, overall force balance, we can actually still continue to use capillary rheometry for a general fluid by focusing on the wall of the material. So, if you uh, for example, look at this capillary and uh, do a force balance, given that now we have this polymer which is uh, flowing what we have is we can do a force balance uh, by looking at a control volume which is ba basically the cylinder itself. And at the wall we have uh, shear stress between polymer which is being forced to move and the wall. This we will call tau r. And uh, in the entry and exit we have P1 and P2 pressure. So, P1 and P2 are acting on pi r squared which is the cross sectional area and the tau r is acting on this surface area which is 2 pi r l. So, if you do a force balance between these two, you can show that uh, tau r is related to delta P by l regardless of the fluid that is available. Similarly, you can do also linear momentum balance uh, on uh, such a material where you do not know what the material type is. But you can still show that uh, the overall stress in the material is a linear function of the stress at the wall. So, when small r is equal to capital R, the shear stress at the wall tau capital R is present. And at the center where r is 0, the stress falls to 0. So, with this uh, knowledge, then we can start developing and which is done using uh, what is called a weissenberg uh, robinovich equation where the strain rate at the wall is also related to the flow rate that is there in the material and it is written in couple of different ways. But you can see that if you measure the flow rate 
and if you measure the tau r by knowing we can calculate what is the gamma dot r at the wall. So, if you know tau r and if you know gamma dot r then you can get the viscosity. So, see in this process we do not know what the fluid type is, but we do not need to know we do not have an expression like the Huygen Poiseuille equation, but by suitable manipulations of variables and by doing force balances and uh, getting to know the variables whatever we know and uh, whatever we can measure we can get an estimate of the viscosity. So, that is why capillary rheometry is very commonly used for uh, polymer processing operation by increasing the pressure drop you can achieve very high flow rates and uh, remember that in all of these cases the tube uh, flow uh, implies that uh, there is uh, basically a velocity profile where the velocity is 0 at the wall and then it is maximum in the center. And so, uh, the shear rate that the polymer is seeing next to the wall is very high and that is what we are estimating and then we are also estimating the wall shear stress and the ratio of these two can give us estimate of the viscosity of the material. Now, one of the things that uh, when you draw a velocity profile like this, it implies that uh, you know it is the same uh, when you travel along the pipe. Then this uh, relations that we have talked about are valid, but generally what will happen is uh, this capillary is being connected to some reservoir through which fluid comes in. So, there will be some entrance effect and so developing flow or entrance effects will require some end corrections and given that capillary rheometry is a very common technique, uh, we also have uh, something called the Bagley correction or uh, there are other corrections which are far more uh, uh, modern in terms of their usage uh, by practitioners. So, uh, we can get very good estimates of viscosity using this capillary rheometry. Let us look at the dynamic viscosity now. Uh, dynamic viscosity is obtained uh, by subjecting the material to a sinusoidal strain rate. If you recall earlier, we had talked about uh, subjecting the material to a strain, sinusoidal strain. And then we looked at uh, the stress that is generated in the material and then we realized also for uh, viscoelastic material there will be a phase lag. So, now similarly now we are subjecting the material to a strain rate because our interest is in calculating viscosity and viscosity is a parameter which relates stress to strain rate. So, the result will be again a stress, but with the phase angle again and now using these two we can then calculate what are the in phase and out of phase component because we know sin a plus b is sin a cos b plus. So, we can expand this and uh, we can have uh, some factor multiplied by sin omega t and some factor multiplied by cos omega t. So, you can see this portion is in phase with input strain rate and uh, we have the out of phase portion also. This is the out of phase and so uh, we will uh, define uh, this as eta double prime and uh, we define uh, the in phase portion as eta prime. And so this is very similar to our earlier uh, definitions where we had defined uh, g star as g prime plus i g double prime and this was in phase or storage. and this was out of phase and loss. But remember here the relation was between stress and strain. In this case we have relation between stress and strain rate. So, this is the loss or dissipation. while this is the storage or elastic. 
So, just the way we had uh, viscous modulus earlier. and we had elastic modulus. Now, we have uh, elastic viscosity or we have loss viscosity. So, oscillatory test again like earlier can be used to split the overall input output relations in trying to ascertain which are the energy dissipative uh, contributions and energy storage contributions or elastic contributions and viscous contributions. And so, therefore, eta star which is the complex viscosity is related to eta prime and eta double prime. And so, eta star uh, which is called the dynamic uh, viscosity is characterized for polymeric system quite often. And let us look at uh, how does this look for uh, simplest possible model which is the Maxwell model. So, for Maxwell model uh, using the ordinary differential equation if we input this strain we can get the solution for stress as a function of time and uh, it will have an in phase component and it will also have an out of phase component. And so, therefore, uh, this is eta double prime or the elastic part of the viscosity and this is eta prime the loss or the usual viscous viscosity. So, the first term is the viscous contribution to the stress and uh, the second term is the elastic contribution. Let us look at uh, how do these uh, variables vary as a function of frequency. Uh, I am sure you can look at it and uh, you can see that uh, when omega is very large, this factor will be very large and therefore, uh, what you will find is eta double prime is 1 over omega as omega tends to very large values. When omega is very small value, then eta double prime will be proportional to omega. Similarly, on the other side, when uh, eta omega is very large, then uh, as omega is very large, then eta prime will basically uh, be 1 over omega squared or it will go to 0 because omega is very large. And uh, if omega is uh, very small, then eta prime will be a constant. So, this is what is depicted here graphically that at low frequencies eta prime is constant and then at high frequencies eta prime keeps on decreasing and this is remember is the viscous or dissipative. contribution. On the other hand, eta double prime increases initially and then decreases and this is the elastic contribution. And this is based on by the way uh, Maxwell model. So, general polymeric melts will have a far more complicated response compared to this as we have seen in case of G prime and G double prime and any other oscillatory property whether it is uh, uh, in terms of creep compl the compliance or J prime and any of those will have similar properties. Similarly, uh, creep or stress relaxation also the response will be far more complicated than what is usually indicated by simple models like Maxwell or standard linear solid model. One of the things that you can notice here is that uh, there is a crossover frequency and uh, this again is where uh, uh, omega lambda is equal to 1. And uh, you can see that uh, when you go for uh, two orders of magnitude, so minus 1 to plus 1, you already see that the response is goes from predominantly viscous to predominantly elastic. So, when we are subjecting the material to very slow frequencies, very low frequencies or very slow rates, polymer molecules behave like a viscous material and therefore, eta prime is constant. This is like saying zero shear viscosity if strain rate is very low in case of steady shear. When we go to higher frequencies, now we are subjecting the material at very fast rates and segments cannot uh, relax the entanglements uh, become uh, basically permanent junction points. So, material behaves more and more elastic. And so, uh, with this kind of a feature you can try to explain 
behavior of uh, polymeric melts which are uh, practically very useful. One of the empirical observations and which has been justified uh, theoretically also is uh, called the Cox merge rule where you can compare uh, the viscosity measurement from a either rotational rheometer or a capillary rheometer in steady shear where strain rate is constant. So, you can plot eta as a function of gamma dot and that is the steady shear uh, measurements. So, let us say it uh, several shear rates the data measurement is done and uh, we usually observe the Newtonian plateau followed by shear thinning response. Now, the same measurement uh, on the material can be carried out by looking at the dynamic viscosity and so therefore, we can do what is called the oscillatory shear and we can measure now eta prime as a function of omega and then plot it. And if uh, both of these superimpose on each other, then uh, that is called that Cox merge rule is being obeyed, which says that uh, as long as gamma dot and omega are same, then eta prime and eta will be same. So, the, this is observed for some of the polymeric melts and whenever this is observed, we know that the structure of polymeric melt is not as complex. But whenever we have filled polymer melts, when there are fibers there or there are uh, liquid crystalline portions. So, any structural complications then many more often than not this Cox merge rule is not observed. So, this is a good way to understand what is the structure of polymeric uh, material while it is flowing uh, and it can be useful for looking at uh, the practical polymeric systems. So, with this uh, we will close our overall discussion related to polymer processing and uh, recycling techniques. We have seen the practical uh, techniques which are used, we have seen the underlying uh, requirements of sustainability to be able to reprocess or recover the materials. We have also seen the rheological response which is very important to determine the overall processing quality and the effectiveness and robustness of these processing and recycling operations. So, with this uh, we will close this uh, lecture. Thank you.